Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as Jessica just recently just said, I am Council Group Vice President for Operations for all of Miami-Dade. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Castle Group, we are a full-service property management firm, proudly managing over 375 communities across the state of Florida, from the Keys to Jacksonville. Uh, we've been in the business for over 30 years and are very familiar with the ongoing challenges boards and associations are facing. Um, there are some other great people who are equally familiar with the association challenges, uh, and they're here with us on the call today. So let me allow them some time to introduce themselves and we'll kick it off with Carolina. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on this panel and for joining us. My name is Carolina Shear. I'm a partner at Eisinger Law um, and we, uh, our main practice focus is representing community associations, condos, co-ops, HOAs throughout the state of Florida. Um, and I personally deal with a lot of general as well as litigation matters often involving uh, maintenance and construction issues related to the associations. Michael. Hello, everybody. Mike Cuevas with Forensic Engineering and Consulting. Uh, we do service associations on construction defect litigation matters. We also perform 40 year recertifications, produce uh, repair documents, provide uh, inspection services for repair provide project management services and uh, owner representation services for uh, uh, many associations and properties across Florida. Um, so I'm happy to participate with you guys today. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Paul. <laughs> yes, my name is Paul Overton. I'm uh, one of the small uh, group of partners and we have 19 divisions across the United States. I'm the partner that runs all the building envelope repairs and construction defect projects, Texas East. Uh, like Michael, we're heavily involved in construction defect, legal analysis, scope creation, cost repairs, and ultimately uh, the repair project, but it's not limited to only construction de defect. We are heavily involved now in the 40 year recertification process and just general park projects that don't fall into one of those two categories. And thanks for having us. Great, we have lots to chat about today. Let's go to the next slide, uh, Jess. And we'll go over some working definitions so that we're all familiar with the terminolo uh, terminology as we move through the presentation. So go ahead, Paul, take it off. Yeah, so I think it's important to understand some working uh, definitions as we go through this PowerPoint. Uh, Basically, the building envelope is comprised of the building exterior building separates that separate the exterior from the interior. Um, typically, those elements include roof coverings, exterior wall claddings, windows, doors, structural elements that support the building envelope, such as floors, walls, um, again, the roofs, support columns, and exposed structural elements such as balconies. And I think in addition to that, um, we should also consider structural concrete, post-tension cable oils, rebar, and structural columns. And for those of you that don't know what post-tension cables are, it's a way of reinforcing concrete. And basically, they're uh, uh, very high-strength wound cables placed inside your structural concrete. Uh, these are placed inside a, uh, the concrete, usually encapsulated in a plastic duct. And once the concrete cures to a certain PSI, these cables are basically stressed or tightened down to give uh, a huge amount of support to the concrete inside these buildings. And I guess, you know, to further expand on that, what can go wrong? I mean, obviously all these elements work in conjunction to try to stop water intrusion and, and water inside the building is really the silent killer. That's what really creates a lot of these damages um, and in terms of post-tension cables, those cables can corrode with rust, they can snap, and then all of a sudden we have a situation where the, the, the reinforcement capabilities or the structural design of the concrete is not acting in the manner it was designed. I guess we could talk about typically excluded. Building envelopes not going to cover interior finishes like paint, drywall. Um, 
interior furnishings, floor, uh, floor coverings, appliances. Um, these are all things that would be considered on the inside of your building. And depending on how the CCNR is read, would be homeowner responsibilities. Next slide. So there are some potential obstacles um, that uh, associations face with regard to proactive maintenance or um, reactive maintenance projects. Uh, as many of you who are joining us, you are volunteer board members. You are not particularly uh, knowledgeable, perhaps, or your industry of practice may not be construction management, engineering, um, or any of the related fields. So you as board members and our owners have to rely upon the experts, your management team, your, your construction professionals, your engineering and architecture, your design professionals to guide you and properly explain to you what you're dealing with. Not every crack is a, of concern. Some are, some not. But you as a lay person will not know that. Um, just as, you know, we have a lot of associations that say, well, our maintenance guy can take care of that. And no, that's not the answer. You need to have a professional engineer in some situations assess whether or not the uh, repairs are appropriate to be done by a maintenance uh, personnel versus a uh, licensed general contractor specializing in uh, the specific component that needs to be addressed. Um, just as we, on a national level, we have um, multiple political parties um, and everyone has a different idea or ideology as to how the country needs to be run and that trickles down into the state, local, municipal level. Every single association is a mini form of government. So you do have different factions. You do have different visions. You have competing agendas of what needs to be done or what the right um, direction for your association should be. And that really causes some obstacles into some of these projects because some, some groups want to get some projects done and other groups believe that that project need not be uh, addressed at the moment. Um, there's also some financial difficulties that associations face, both from an organizational standpoint, uh, budgeting, reserving, um, prioritizing what projects need to be addressed first, um, and these projects are costly. I mean, there's there's no way to 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 make this more palatable. They're very costly and very time consuming. And then you have, on a personal basis, the individual residents. We have a lot of residents that are elderly and on fixed incomes, um, and so special assessments and and increased maintenance costs hit these people very hard. So we do have a lot of financial difficulties that we have to address. Last but not least, there's a technical component of how to carry out these projects from a contracting, from limitations in particular governing documents of what you can, cannot do, what you can and cannot spend, um, perhaps whether or not you need uh, membership approval and votes to do some of these projects. So these are all obstacles that get into the way of proactive maintenance um, and reactive, uh, re reactive solutions. Next slide. So Michael is going to take us through uh, these next few slides. We're going to talk about different types of inspections and the frequency as to how, you know, how frequently they should be done. So let's move to the next slide, Joe. So here's a, a very good question that can speak to proactive inspections, right? Do we have to wait for a 40 or 50 year recertification notice from the city to inspect our building? And to answer that question, um, I didn't want to just tell you, I just wanted to show you. Can you go to the next slide, please? So here we have on the left, we're looking at a joint in a parking deck. Um, substantially large opening. I mean, there is no reason why we have to wait for the structure to get to this condition. Uh, the photo on the right is a close-up of what you see on the left. 
I mean, if you look at some of the concrete reinforcing there, it literally uh, feathers to to nothing. Um, so, you know, something like this um, is consistent with having exposure to water on the order of years, right? So this is some of the damage that we can avoid. Uh, next slide, please. Here's another example. Uh, photo on the left is a column in a parking garage directly underneath a pool. Uh, you see there's several vertical cracks in the column. We've, we've had a section of concrete spall off. It's exposing the vertical rebar. On the right is a steel beam that's supporting some rooftop units. Uh, this is structural steel that's exposed to the elements. It's a building that's on the coastline here. And you can see what happens to the steel after a few years. I think this particular beam has been in place for seven to eight years. So in a, in, in a, in a very short period of time, you can see that we've already have lost some of the cross section of the member. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, let's talk about the difference between performing periodic inspection and a 40 and 50 year recertification. So the 40 and 50 year recertification is a requirement by Miami-Dade and Broward counties. Uh, it's most buildings, the only buildings that are excluded are very small uh, structures. Uh, but in general, in a nutshell, uh, these inspections are meant to identify any life safety issues with the building, specifically structural and electrical, and they're required to, to be performed when the building reaches its 40 year birthday, and then every 10 years thereafter. Whereas periodic inspection uh, can be performed anytime, right? You don't need a, you don't need a notice from the county uh, any board or association can decide to have periodic inspection of their building. It could also be part of your regular maintenance program. Uh, just a, a couple of things to include would be, you know, not just structural, not just structure, not just uh, the electrical systems, but also take a look at building envelope. Just picking off on uh, Paul Overton's comments right? Um, this is really a question of managing water and water intrusion into your building. Uh, having said that, we want to evaluate the building envelope, the exterior wall cladding, the roof covering, to make sure we identify those areas and we take care of them. Um, so this also goes to not just identifying and repairing damage, which is correcting the symptom, but also trying to identify the cause of the damage and making corrections there so that this damage doesn't occur again and doesn't make existing damage worse. Uh, and one important thing would be to make sure that a board or an association is budgeting and planning for these inspections and not just waiting you know, to receive a notice from a county when they receive their 40 year birthday. Next slide, please. As we're moving on to the next slide, you know, these are things that your management company on an annual basis when they're reviewing your reserve studies, when they're giving you their building inspection reports on a you know, weekly, monthly basis, that these are being brought to the board's attention so that we can be proactive and, uh, and, and remedy these issues that we're finding at the property. And hopefully they don't get to the extent of what we see in these pictures. Correct. Uh, this, this slide shows the items that are covered by 40 year uh, recertifications. So foundations, roof coverings, a lot of the structure here. Um, so I just wanna comment on these as we go through. So I think it's important to know that most foundations are not exposed to view. I get a lot of questions on, can the foundations be inspected? Um, so a lot of foundations, especially foundations along the coast, are, are, are what are called deep foundations. So these are typically piles or caissons that extend tens of feet into the ground. So inspection of these systems is not something that can be done easily. 
or safely for that matter. However, uh, differential movement of foundations can be determined by visual inspections of finishes, uh, which is typically produces cracks in walls. Uh, a lot of windows door openings would have cracks over them. And another telltale sign would be uh, binding doors, doors that, that don't operate smoothly. Uh, for your roof coverings, you know, you can look at this item and say, well, this is not exactly structural. It's not, but the reason that it's on this list is that if your roof covering is not performing, you're going to be allowing water into the building and subsequently, you know, uh, producing uh, the type of damage that you see on, on the picture to the right here. Um, Road bearing masonry, these are walls that actually support the building as opposed to a wall that's just separating a space, a partition wall. Uh, so we're looking for cracks, falls, displacement, separation. Steel framing, while steel framing is not predominantly used in South Florida, it is used for some secondary structures similar to the beam that we saw on one of the slides previously to support roof dunnage. It could also be used for low roofs, canopies. So even though it's not primary structure, um, you know, we still do have structural steel on buildings. Uh, floor and roof framing. Uh, the one thing to consider here is that most floors and roofs are concealed with finishes, right? Whether they be floor finishes or ceiling finishes. But again, um, you know, identifying damage, you would expect to see displaced finishes, cracking in the finishes. Those would suggest that something's going on with your floor roof framing. Uh, concrete framing, we see in the photos that, you know, concrete is prone to cracking and spalling. Uh, pretty, pretty common damage in buildings in South Florida. Windows, again, not structural, uh, but there, there are two reasons why windows is on this list. One is that the county does require that the windows be visually inspected to make sure that they are anchored uh, adequately to the building. And then second is for water intrusion. Again, water is going to lead to damage. Michael, I have a question here, if you yeah. don't mind me jumping in. Yeah. Um, I have a, Mr. Carlos is asking, if you fix the corroded rebar, uh, can that accelerate the corrosion on the rebar? Oops, someone just, hold on. Rebar that has less corrosion. So let me read that again because it popped off the screen. So if you can fix the corroded rebar, can that accelerate the corrosion on the rebar that has less corrosion? No, but there is a there's a phenomenon where the chloron content in the concrete can promote corrosion. Uh, if that's the case, um, what can be done is that you can install a device um, that reduces that that chemical reaction in the concrete and will minimize you know uh, chloride content corrosion in your concrete. Uh, that can be checked by taking a sample of the concrete, sending it to a laboratory, and getting an analysis done. Um, so, in, you know, installing brand new rebar doesn't accelerate it, but what, what can happen sometimes is you can repair corroded rebars and small concrete around it, and then say two years later have similar damage adjacent to it. That's not the rebar that you installed that's causing that, that in that case is actually the chloride content in the concrete, and that is inherent when the concrete was initially placed. Right, so maybe, the, the typical process is that you would specify that they would chase the corroded rebar until they to the point of where there's healthy per se, right? Uh, rebar that's cor that, that's correct. But sometimes when you have a high chloride content in concrete, uh, I, I've been to uh, on projects where. You fix an area, and then next year, the, the area next to it is damaged. You fix that area, and the area next to it is damaged. That has to do with the chloride content, not with mm -hmm. the materials that you're installing. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, wood framing. Yes, wood framing is used in South Florida. Um, I'm actually working on a project now where uh, there's a pretty large wood frame gazebo on a pool deck. Uh, and it's, you know, pretty poor shape that needs to be uh repaired 
but the damages decay due to water intrusion. But one that's not uh, probably spoken about enough is uh, insect damage. Uh, because, because South Florida is a very moist environment, uh, there's a lot of termite damage and other insect damage to wood framing members. Um, and then loading. This one doesn't get a lot of discussion, but one of the ways that uh, you can lead to some sort of structural failure is by changing the use of the space. Uh, for example, let's say uh, an association took two residential units, combined them into one, and now all of a sudden that's a recreation room or an assembly space. Well, by making that change, you have in essence changed the live load on that floor. Um, so that's why it's important to review uh, kind of history of the building, changes of use, to see if any of the loading uh, in, in spaces has changed. Uh, next slide, please. So a few more questions here. Um, I see uh, approximately how much money should an association budget for a 40, 50 year recertification? Uh, we can probably address that a little further down, but a lot of that has to do with properly funding your reserves, right? Um, fully funding over, you know, and following your reserve study uh, accordingly. We can move to the right. next slide, Jess. So also part of your 40 year is an electrical um, assessment. So, you know, uh, here, here's some of the items that are in actually the, the county guidelines, the bulleted items here. You know, an electrical, your electrical service consists of fuses, breakers, you would check the size of amperage, conditioning, sorry, condition of grounding, equipment clearance, um, inspection of electrical panels, your branch circuits are really um, you know, conductors, again, grounding of equipment for items such as uh, your emergency generator, your conduits are wiring, checking for erosion, dents in conduit, uh, checking for conduits that don't have the correct capacity. And then it goes to the emergency lighting is your exit sign lighting, it's lighting in egress areas, like your stairs, your entries to the building, uh, covered parking spaces or parking garages, checking your that you have a functional fire alarm, checking that you have functioning smoke detectors. So in a nutshell, anything on the electrical side that could potentially start a fire and anything that has to do with egress, where in an emergency you have to exit the building, those are the items that the uh, 40 year electrical uh, recertification are looking at. Next slide. I'm going to turn this over to Paul Overton. He's going to talk about defects and construction defects. Thank you, Michael. Uh, great, great slides there. <clears throat> Typically, when we talk about defects in building or construction defects, we have two types of defects that we need to be concerned of or with. We have patent defects, which some examples would be spalling concrete, stress packs and support columns, deteriorated waterproof coatings, large cracks in stucco, interior water intrusion, failing roof coverings and leaky windows. These are the type of defects that we can see um, typically on a visual inspection of the building. However, we also need to consider latent defects. And these are the ones that you can't see. And you can see an example here where we actually cut into some stucco and this is what we found behind the stucco, rotten framing members, uh, structural beams, interior insulations, um, on roof, Rough coverings, a lot of times the sheeting or even the trusses are rotten. Um, a lot of these defects that are considered latent defects, there's no way that we can tell without with certainty what the extent of these damages are. And just coming from the construction defect nits, we actually have a process where we do an investigation and generally they would hire 
a construction defect uh, professional and an engineer, and they would actually make openings into the building so that we can look at uh, potential damages to post tension cables, um, potential defects to rebar and structural concrete. Those things, and you know, I think we could all agree just because of the the recent advance and stuff that is going on um, behind the scenes that may be revamping the 40 year certification that some of these processes may entail stuff like this just because it's so hard to really tell what's going on inside the building walls unless we open them up. Next slide, please. If it's you, Mike. He's muted. You're muted. How's that? That's better. Okay, uh, evaluation statements. Uh, so there's really three, there's, there's really three, um, you know, conditions that can be reported for your building. One, it's safe. Two, it's safe with qualifications. Or three, it's unsafe. Okay. So let's start with the worst one here. If it's unsafe, this typically means that at least a portion of your building cannot be occupied, or in the worst case scenario, the entire building, which we've saw, we've seen some examples of that in South Florida over the last few weeks, where buildings have been evacuated. Uh, so that's pretty easy. There's that that's typically something along the lines that you know you have a structural member that's deteriorated to the point that, in the engineer's opinion, can no longer safely support, um, you know, the overlying structure and the loads that are being imposed on it. Uh, safe with qualifications. Uh, this means that you have some structural repairs to be completed, but it's not uh, to the extent where the building has to be uh, evacuated. Uh, so uh, this could be some, you know, some cracking, some spalling in specific areas around the building. And then safe is basically you have no issues on the electrical side. You know, if you have an unsafe building, you're typically going to have one or more components in your electrical system that are at risk to starting a fire and or they do not allow the safe evacuation of a building in an emergency. You know, uh, so that would be unsafe, safe with qualifications. An, an example of that could be maybe you're missing some exit signs that would show uh, occupants, you know, the, the exit path, something along that, those lines. Or maybe you have some minor corrosion in some panels that, that needs to be repaired. That would be safe with qualifications and then obviously safe as you have no issues whatsoever. I have a few questions here coming through as it in regards to uh, code enforcement, right? So um, let's say they're doing some repairs and now the repair, you know, they, the building was designed under previous code um, and now there are significant repairs that are needed. Uh, how do we address that in the scope of work? Um, or what is expected as far as are they going to be required to build, bring the building back up to code in the, in the, in the specs? It's a great question. So on the structural side, so there is there is a a building code in Florida that's specific for existing buildings, and in this code, uh, it establishes a threshold to structural uh, systems, and if the damage does not go over this threshold of damage that's identified in the building code, then it can be repaired, you know, to its previous condition. If you do uh, exceed this threshold, then you do have to make some uh, code upgrades. Um, and those, they're very specific, they're, they're in this code. Uh, so you have to you basically have to uh, establish what the threshold is for your building and then compare it to the damage that you have to see if you've exceeded the threshold. Uh, but in, in most cases, um, unless you have some severe damage you are allowed to perform a structural repair to restore the building and the structure to its pre-damaged condition. Uh, but you do need to go through this evaluation process. 
Yeah. Now, in terms of electrical, I know that there are a lot of different um, ordinances set by cities that do grandfather some buildings in, but they also ask other systems to be upgraded regardless of the age of the building. A good example of that would be uh, your fire alarm system. Right? Uh, and just to give you an example, if you're replacing your fire panel and that panel is not the same uh, manufacturer and model number, you're required to check your entire uh, fire alarm system to make sure that it meets current code. So I guess the question varies on component, whether you're structural or electrical, and and you have to go to the code to to check you know where you fall. Do you think uh, Anne's here? I posed the question. Would this apply to windows, right? So let's say, how would an in, an inspector handle condo buildings where twenty percent of the condos have impact window, and the other eighty percent have forty year old you know rollout windows? Yeah. So if you're replacing a window. You know, most municipalities are going to require you to meet current code. Um, if we're just, you know, reapplying ceiling around the window, you know, you're, you're not going to be required. So it, it depends on, you know, the scope of work. Um, but in, in most cases, if you're replacing a window, you're going to be required to install an impact resistant window. Great. Thank you. Let's move on to the next slide. Yeah, so certification timeline. I get this question a lot. Most most uh, associations wait too long to get this started. Uh, I think I've also seen this question in the chat, you know, where people say, I have not received my notice for 40 year recertification. Um, folks, you know, you don't have to wait for the letter. Uh, if you know your building is 40 years, you know you need to comply, don't wait. The other thing to note here is because of COVID, many of these uh, the building department offices were shut down. There are many, many, many cities that are behind on issuing their notice of 40 year recertification. Uh, don't wait. I mean, if you have issues, if you're 40 years or more, get the process started. If you haven't reached your 40 year birthday, remember this, it takes time to select engineer. You need to receive a proposal. You may receive multiple proposals. You have to go through an evaluation process, select the engineer, sign the contract, which could take time, right? If you have attorneys on both sides reviewing contracts. Um, so it could take you weeks, maybe even months to retain an engineer. So you wanna make sure that you give yourself ample time to go through that process. Uh, and then once you actually hire an engineer, you know, he has to schedule the, the, the inspection. Uh, so if you're proactive and give yourself time and start the process before you actually receive this notice, you're going to be in much better shape. So the counties give you 90 days from receiving the notice to comply with the recertification. So if you already have an engineer on board, it makes it much easier for you to comply with the 90 day requirement. Just to add to that, right? It, uh, just to provide some more background, the form for the 40 year certification is readily available online, right? So, um, and what is covered in that form and what the engineer needs to complete when submitting it to the, um, to, to your local city. So that's why this is actually, you know, your 40 and 50 year, you can get way ahead of it. Um, by having your engineer perform the evaluation and then plan for those repairs. There's also um, it's something that we're, we're missing. This, this concept of recertification is, is really germane to Miami-Dade and Broward counties, although that's going to change. So if you are in Palm Beach County or any of the other counties throughout the state of Florida and your property is um, aging or showing any any concern or, or really as part of the lifespan of a property, you should be undergoing these types of evaluations and inspections irrespective of whether there's a requirement by your county or municipality to do this. This isn't just because you're being told to do it. This is because you're on a board, you are in an association, 
and you should proactively be doing this to maintain the fit health and safety of your building. Correct, and it actually goes to another discussion point on uh, another common question that I get is, you know, should we wait 40 years? How often should we inspect our building? Um, I originally come from the Northeast. Uh, New York City has a history of failing facades. There's a lot of mainstream facades in New York City, and they have a local requirement there to inspect the facade of your building every seven years. There are other states that have similar uh, inspections of not just the facade, but also, <clears throat> you know, a building structure, and, and those range seven to 12 years. So, you know, I can tell you from experience that the 40-year requirement here in South Florida in these two counties uh, is pretty different from what's being done in, in many other cities and states in the country. With that being said, you know, what can you do to perform periodic inspections? <clears throat> you know, one of the things that, that happens here frequently is the exterior of the building gets painted, you know, seven to eight, maybe ten, every 10 years. When you paint your building, uh, you know, it's most likely that you're going to have scaffolding, swing staging in place so that the contractor can actually access all of these surfaces and paint them. I mean, that would be a great opportunity to bring in an engineer because he's going to have access already in place, right? So the cost of performing uh, an inspection of your exterior cladding there is much less because all of the scaffolding and swing staging would be in place. I mean, that you, you can start to come up with ways like that where you can schedule some of these inspections over the life of a building to coincide with other work so that you're not having to erect scaffolding or hang swing staging just to do an inspection of your building. Uh, so just I, just, I know we got a little bit off traffic on this, on this uh, slide here, but some things to consider. Uh, the remaining items here, two through nine, really have to do with work that needs to be accomplished after your recertification forms and letter are submitted to the county. Um, these involve addressing any deficiencies that were identified by your engineer. Um, they would be if you fall in the category with safety qualifications or unsafe. Mm -hmm. The counties give you 180 days to re re remedy these deficiencies. But when you look at these items two through nine, that's a lot of scope to have happen in 180 days, right? So uh, the engineer most likely would have to come up with a detailed repair scope, you know, maybe generate drawings. You'd have to bid this, right? To get uh, pricing from contractors. You know, that process can take again, weeks to months. And then you actually select the contract to perform the work. It's very unlikely that you're going to do that in 180 days. Uh, so what can you do? You know, you could try to pre-qualify some, some contractors, identify a group of contractors that you can maybe pre-screen and have them ready to bid your job. Uh, that's one of the things you can do. Uh, in most cases, you, if the county sees that you're being proactive and actually working to correct these issues, you can apply for an extension to complete the work. Uh, another important thing to keep in mind. But uh, these items two through nine, you know, you have to get the ball rolling before you receive these letters and before your engineer submits their recertification forms because you just won't, you just won't get them done on time. Uh, and I'm just thinking about the typical building with the typical amount of repair work that would need to happen. You know, if you're, if you were proactive and did a bunch of repair work before reaching this stage, you may be in very good shape and may have only, you know, minor repairs to conduct it. If that's the case, then kudos to you. But um, two through nine is, is a lot of work and a lot of coordination. So you have to, you know, almost start months and maybe even a year early to, to try to be in a good place. Next slide. Uh, just really quick as we move through here, um, 
you know, the if you're in attendance, the you do not have the opportunity uh, to actually speak. So please use the Q and A function, the chat function, and we will get to your your question, please. Audrey, do you want to take any of the questions in the Q and A? Um, we do have one that says, "What can be done about water settling on balconies?" Yeah, so that would be either a design or construction defect because you know water should not settle on your balcony. It should always be uh, directed away from the building. But if you do have that, you'd have to look at maybe adding some sort of product on the balcony floor that would give you positive drainage away from the building. Uh, just one thing to consider there is you wanna make sure that whatever product you're installing is not going to overstress the balcony floor structure. So, you know, you have you need an engineer to evaluate that for you. So actually to touch upon that, we get a lot of issues from legal on unit owners who want to install flooring on their balconies and they don't understand why an association would or would not want to do this or they had flooring before, then the association goes through uh, the repair process and does not allow the installation of flooring. Um, the, the explanation I always give, and Michael, I'd like your input, is because if the flooring is not properly installed or sloped, it will allow for that ponding in those um, uh, balconies, and you are then causing, again, the same problem that you just corrected. I don't know if you have a different take on that, but that's really why we discourage many of, of uh, the unit owners from installing floorings, carpetings, or anything that would trap moisture um, and affect the, the concrete structure. Yeah, that's a really good point. <clears throat> um, one, of the, one of the examples I could give is tile. So the thin set that they use to set the tile on the concrete uh, balconies, it breaks down the waterproofing. And then the mortar between the tiles allows water intrusion. So now you have a water layer sitting between the tile and the concrete balcony with no waterproofing between that and the rebar or post tension cables in the concrete. So that's one of the big reasons we don't allow or we try to discourage floor coverings on, on these buildings or balconies, especially after the repair project has just been recently done. And to add some color too on the inspections, um, something that hasn't been brought up, it's a really good idea to do an inspection of your building once the developer turns over the association to the elected board officials within the community. That's a great time to do maybe even a ground level inspection or a visual inspection. Please understand a lot of these issues that we're seeing repeated throughout these buildings in South Florida, they were originally construction defects to begin with. They were just never caught. And over the years, they've gotten worse and worse. So please keep in mind, you can do an inspection at any time you have, you know, when you do a construction project or even at building turnover. I have one uh, last question before we move on to the next uh, section here. So in the event that, uh, and, uh, and anyone on the panel can answer this, uh, there's a strong hurricane coming and, you know, the building is currently under, you know, structural repairs right? Um, can the board mandate an evacuation of the building? Let's say if the local authorities haven't mandated the evacuation, though. Yeah, I think, so, from, about, yeah, I was just going to add, usually as a contractor, we have to have an emergency provision within our contract in the event there's a storm coming. But I'll let Carolina take it from here since she's yeah, got for the resident. Yeah. So it, it all depends on the nature of the repairs. Um, Paul alluded to this. Most, uh, you know, good contracts uh, of these natures will have a mobilization demo, no, demobilization provision for the contractors, whether it be securing equipment uh, and materials, uh, removing scaffolding, uh, uh, you know, taking down the cranes. A few years back, and, and pardon me, I don't remember what uh, storm it was. We had an issue, if you all remember, in downtown with a crane that collapsed during one of the storms um, and it caused substantial damage. So those are all things that need to be 
uh, prepared from an operational standpoint. From the question that this unit owner um, provides, generally speaking, we will know whether or not the condition of a building is such that pending construction could affect or require you to evacuate. You have to remember that your contractor, your engineer are also working, especially your engineer, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but you would be serving as a special inspector, which is an arm or a de uh, you're essentially deputized by the city. So if the engineer deems a condition to be an unsafe condition, even uh, with an incoming storm, and even if the municipality hasn't issued evacuation orders, then yes, um, at that point in time, it would be really a cooperation between the engineer, the contractor, and we would contact the city to try to assist us. Um, the problem that you will have is we can't knock down doors and force people out of their homes if they don't want to. That requires a judicial process. Um, you know, the, the fire marshal and the building officials may have some um, more uh, powers in their, in their chest to address this, but you as an association will not be able to require someone to evacuate their unit without necessary legal action or collaboration from the municipality. Yeah, one, one thing to keep in mind is that, one, you wanna make sure that you do have that hurricane preparation plan from your contractor that Paul discussed, right? That's very important. But also keep in mind that some of these storms develop very quickly in a, in a period of 24 to 48 hours, you know, you can get a tropical storm to escalate to a hurricane. What does that mean? I mean, even if your contractor has a plan, he may not have time to take everything down. Uh, so if we ever run into a situation where, you know, the building is not safe, um, you know, our first duty is to public safety. So we would work with local officials to make sure that people are safe. And if that means evacuating the building, then that would be the recommendation. Just taking a step back to the balconies, you know, you you guys are both right. The tile tends to trap moisture against the slab, so that's not good. But the second item would be that it doesn't allow for inspection, right? I, I was at a property recently and they said, can you inspect our balconies? And I looked, almost every single balcony floor is covered with tile. I cannot inspect uh, a balcony floor that I can't see. So that's another reason why maybe having tile on balcony floors is not a good idea. Great. Let's move on to the next slide. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. So what does it entail to qualify a contractor? And I'd like to start with um, proper light sensing first. So general contractors and specialty contractors have different licensing requirements. Generally speaking, a specialty contractor like a painter or a window installer, they have, they hold a lesser, I guess, not value is not the right verb, but a lesser version of a general contractor's license. General contractors are typically um, able to perform any kind of trade or subcontract any type of trade. So in terms of qualifying your contractors, it's very important to understand what kind of license they may have. I can give you an example of if you hire a painter, but in the course of their scope of work, they, they come across rebar or you know, a broken post tension cable, they are definitely not qualified to do that type of work. Um, there are ways to search the licensing. Uh, there's a website listed right here. We use it all the time for our subcontractors and even our competitors. A lot of states have what they call a contractor's board. Um, this contractor board, you have to register with them, provide all your insurances and your licensing to actually be able to perform work in that state. There's also a process where um, people can complain if they're not happy with the contractor's work to the contractor's board. They keep a list of all those complaints and they ensure that the contractor takes care of the client or they have a complaint registered against the contractor for a certain period of time. Um, HOA board members, general counsel attorneys, management companies, they can check these resources to see exactly who you're hiring. Um, 
And I guess to expand on that, there is the Better Business Bureau. There's there's lists like Angie's List, but contractors like us, we don't subscribe to those because those are mostly geared for residential. So please do a little bit more digging into the BBB because somebody like me is probably not in there. I'm definitely not in Angie's List. So if you're if you're looking to qualify a contractor of that magnitude, just remember to you know do your due diligence, seek out other references. You know, people like Carolina and Michael are a great option for providing referrals. Generally, there's, you know, certain contractors that do, you know, construction defect or 40 year certifications. Um, also, we remember, are these contractors, do they work in HOAs? Okay. This happens all the time. We'll see an HOA hire a new construction company and guess what? It's a debacle. They're not used to working around units that are occupied. They're not used to working around hardscaped uh, buildings. They're not used to going to the board meetings. They don't know the nuances of the boards, how they operate, how they work. Um, just, you know, the, the idea that a contractor can do a new construction job where it's basically production and then going and do a renovation job where it includes destructive testing and finding rotten rebar, it's a whole different type of contracting. So. Remember that um, most contractors we're going to need to they're going to need to have general liability, and this insurance covers claims arising out of damage caused by the contractor. Uh, this is probably one of the most important insurances a contractor can carry, and you have to look at the limits. You know, we see contractors with three hundred thousand dollar limits, and then you know five million in an excess of five million. Uh, please make sure your contractor has the correct liability insurance. And a lot of times when repair drawings are made and scopes of work are created by either the engineer or a professional in the construction industry, they will spell out what kind of uh, liability insurance is needed. Um, workman's comp, that's huge. Uh, this covers the employee of a company if they're injured while fulfilling their job duties. And I want you to understand too, employee is the key word here, okay? If I'm a general contractor, I have workman's comp that covers my employees. It does not cover subcontractors. They don't make an insurance policy that I can buy that will cover anybody that works for me. So it's very important for, and I know Carolina and Michael understand this, but it's very important to find out if your contractor is using subcontractors or if they're using employees, because if they're subcontracting, we need to check the insurance policies of all the subcontractors. It's, you know, it's, Caroline, do you want to say something? Yeah, so there's, there's two things I wanted to add to that. When we look at contracts on behalf of our association, one of the provisions that we do include is that not only the contractor be required to carry this insurance, but that their subcontractors be required to carry the insurance as well. So that, that makes the contractor uh, responsible to ensure that any of their subcontractors has the adequate insurance. Taking that a step further, it's very nice for me to put those clauses in these contracts. However, the association and its management company have to ensure that they gather those documents and have them on file and always keep updated records. Moreover, when we started this, pro, um, this presentation, we talked about availing yourself of your experts. I'm an attorney. I'm not an insurance expert. Your manager is your manager. Your manager is not an insurance exp expert. You have, every association should have an insurance agent. That is the person you should be going to for these big ticket contracts especially mm -hmm. and having them assist you in determining whether or not that contractor is providing you with adequate insurance for your project. Otherwise, it may look very nice on paper, but when push comes to shove and you have to file a claim, that, that coverage may have, as Paul's gonna talk about it, an exclusion. So you have to be very careful and avail yourself of your consultants. Yeah, usually, <laughs> To the extent that the boards do research, they'll ask for the, the insurance certifications of the general contractor. Myself would be included in that. I submit my certifications, and usually that's all the investigation that's done. 
the board doesn't give thought to is if this is going to be performed by my guys and my subcontracting or any other contractor. So, you know, to, to add color to Carolina's statements, we have to ensure that everybody on that project has workman's comp and liability. And in a lot of cases, auto too. Um, we're going to get into auto insurances, but thank you for adding that in. Um, I like that. But uh, there is a, a question here on the chat. Um, you know, when would a board know uh, or an association be aware of if, when they need to hire a structural engineer versus a civil engineer? Oh, Michael, I can answer that. <laughs> a civil engineer um, works on site grading, <clears throat> things like site, sidewalk, the, the actual grade that's coming up to your building, uh, site structures, retaining walls outside of the building, um, storm drainage, sanitary drainage, once it leaves the building. Those are some of the, the items that a civil engineer would work on. A structural engineer is going to work on foundations, columns, floor framing, roof framing, load bearing walls. Uh, so there is a, a difference in the work that they do. Hopefully that answers the question. Michael, what about the difference between an engineer and an architect with all this? Because I get that question a lot. Right. So excuse me, an architect, if you're working on a brand new project, an architect is responsible for determining, uh, you know, how many bedrooms do you have? How many bathrooms? How large do I have to make the corridor to have safe egress? How many stairs do I need? Uh, so he's laying out the space and then the structural engineer is designing all of the structure to support the building. But if we're talking about uh, renovation, an architect is probably more geared towards uh, building envelope, roof coverings, exterior wall claddings, where an engineer is going to look at structure. Again, framing, columns, walls uh, that are supporting the building. Um, having said that, if you get into forensic engineering, then uh, those type of engineers do both um, structure and building envelope. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Contractor interviews. So many, many cases we see boards, um, they want to make a decision without meeting the contractor. And in my opinion, that's a really bad idea. I feel like you need to make meet face to face with your contractor. Um, a lot of times you can get a good feeling whether they're trustworthy or not can establish a comfort level. Um, you can learn more about the contractor. Um, questions to answer. So during these contractor interviews, there's so many things that you should be asking your contractors. And I'll just touch on some of them. But generally, these contractor interviews happen after an engineer has been hired and he's created a scope of work. Um, the scope of work goes out to bid to generally three or four contractors, and they all provide an estimate based on the repair drawings and the scope of work. Um, please do not fall into the trap where a contractor tells you we don't need repair drawings, we don't need a scope of work, because that happens all the time. We, not just me, but contractors go in and tell the boards, hey, we need to hire an engineer. We need a scope of work and we need repair drawings because part of the process of these, especially the large scale construction projects is we have to get permits. And I assure you, every time we pull a permit, we have to have engineered drawings and a scope of work and an NOC signed and a permit application. We can't do that without the help of an engineer. So it's very, very, very important. And there's also, there's a, there's a, a correlation between price and then telling you that you don't need an engineer. So just remember that the old age saying of you get what you pay for, bad trap to fall and make sure you involve an engineer. And listen, if the engineer tells you, hey, I don't, you don't need repair drawings for this, great, right? There's still a possibility you may when you go to the city, but just make sure you do your due diligence. Um, some of the questions that we see um, at these interviews is, where are you guys going to stage your equipment materials? 
how are you going to access the buildings? Is it swing stage? Is it scaffolding? Is it boom lifts? Do you need permits? Retainage. Okay, we're going to pay your invoices, but do we get to hold something back like 10 or 15% until the end of the job? Inspections. Who's going to do the inspections? Who is going to do the sign-offs for the completed work? And how does that tie into the invoicing? The communication process. Do they track the project online? Do they have door hangers? Do they create a letter to the residents? Is there a 24-hour hotline that you can that you can call to get service? I mean, as you all know, these projects, especially in these condos and HOAs, you know, a lot of times the buildings are open. We get water intrusion. You need an emergency. Uh, you need an emergency plan. What's going to happen if somebody starts getting water intrusion into their unit and starts damaging the interior? What's that communication process? What is your plan? Uh, does the contractor use employees or do they use subcontractors? And I know we keep coming up to that same topic, but it's very important to understand that. Um, it changes the whole dynamic. A lot of times if a contractor is using in-house employees, they control the schedule, they control the insurance, they control the warranty. It's all under one house. Um, in terms of pay schedule, have they created a pay application with a schedule of values? It's very important to understand how much this contract, how much work he's going to be performing each month, and what is the price tag associated with that amount of work? And is it clear cut at the beginning of the project that each task or each section or each phase has a price and the, and the, the board is not getting over uh, charge? Will a contractor come to monthly meetings? Again, these are long lasting, very complicated projects. Is your contractor willing to come uh, once a month with a PowerPoint, explain what's been done? Typically the engineer will come along and do a presentation for the community. These are occupied units. There's hundreds of questions that come up. It's very important that you keep the community members um, uh, up to date. Up to date. What's that? Audrey? Informed. They want to be informed. Yeah, up to date and informed. Um, the financial stability of the company. Is this a $2 million company or is this a $100 million company? That plays, like, the bigger the project, the more financially stable the company should be. Like, there's instances I've seen in the past where sometimes the, they're slow at paying their bills. Does the contractor have to shut down or demobilize because he didn't get a check every Friday? That's a big consideration. Um, deposits, what kind of deposit is the contractor asking for? Typically we see deposits from 10 to 50%. I feel like 50% is pretty extreme. I would like to see it closer to 10, 15, maybe 20. And that gives the contractor the ability to possibly buy some materials, but if they don't have the financial wherewithal to be able to fund this project for the most part on their own, that could be potential red flag. Um, project duration, when are they gonna start? What are the working hours? What are the working days? Do they work four 10 hour days, Monday through Thursday, and they have a makeup day on Friday and Saturday? Um, emergency plan, I know we touched on this before. What are we gonna do in case of a storm? Do we have booms lifts? Do we have cranes? Do we have scaffolding that we need to tie down or dismantle? Um, what does the communication look like in terms of the engineer and the contractor and the residents and the board all working together. Production schedule, very important. Um, typically, uh, any good contractor will be able to give you a production schedule that says this is where we'll be on such and such date. If we have situations with materials, they don't get delivered on time, it rains, um, you know, a subcontractor doesn't show up, but those are all things that should be outlined in your contract and you should have a production schedule. And the residents, a lot of times, should be given access to this with, of course, subject to change, but at least they know, you know, um, broad strokes where that contractor, what their plan is, where they're gonna be um, during the project. Uh, payment terms, how does this contractor wanna get paid? Do they have to get paid every Friday or Another situation is that I like better is, does the engineer do inspections, sign off the work, and then the contractor submits an invoice with potentially some retainage? Very important. Um, you know, I feel like it's a much safer bet for the community to pay on approved work by the engineer. Uh, yes. 
I mean, that's a lot of great information, but I can see a board member or even a property manager where their head is spinning right now. I get um, it. <laughs> I, I just, I, I just Carolina wanna, comes in. <laughs> yeah, I just want to point that's out right. that, right. you know, this is where having a great team in place right. is going to help you uh, get through the process and give you Correct. recommendations. Someone like an attorney, right? It's going to give you some legal advice on the contract but also having an engineer that's going to sit in on some of these interviews, uh, you know, provide guidance on, you know, the bidder selection, the bidder evaluation process um, and set up protocols to handle a lot of the questions that, that you, that you brought up. Carolina. So there's, there's um, obviously I'm very, very much involved in this contractor process. Um, more and more, I'm recommending to my associations that there be an additional team member involved, and I find this team member to be critical, and that would be a owner's rep or project manager that represents you as the association. Um, a lot of our associations dump this work on your property manager. Your property manager is putting out management fires day in and day out. And for projects of this massive size, you want a, a in my, my opinion, a knowledgeable project manager owner's rep that will act as an interface between your engineer. Um, because, you know, I look at the engineers and a lot of the times they speak in techie language. No offense, Michael. But, you know, you need someone to translate, um, even to me as to what it is, what's better, what the options are, to stay on top of the contractor, to stay on top of everybody. That's the job of an owner's rep. And I can't stress how some of my projects that do have owner's reps specifically, separate from an engineer and the contractor, really do make a lot of headway. Um, so there's the other op, uh, situation is when your engineer prepares your scope of work, and your bid package, which obviously I recommend your owner's rep to be involved in. What I like to do is have the proposed contract in that bid package, okay? And here's why. And, and, and here's the, the, the caveat. That contractor who's bidding should know what he's getting into. And there are minimum terms that the association must impose and Paul's gone through many of those that have to be in those contracts. And if they're not, then that bid should not be awarded. Taking it a step further, especially with concrete restoration, which is often quantity based, okay, there should not be any movement on those contract terms or jiggling of the wording without your engineer and your owner's rep taking a look and looking to see what impact that could have. Because for example, sometimes those quantity-based contracts, they're also tied into what they call general conditions, for example. So if you have an increase in your quantities, you're gonna have an increase in the cost for general conditions, which may or may not make sense, but it's a huge impact to your association. So when you're looking at a contract, I would proactively have contract terms that must be in every contract, okay? And then if you make any tweaks whatsoever, your engineer and your owner's rep must be a part of that tweak. Um, that, I, I can't stress that enough. I mean, that will say make or break you in the long run because anyone who tells you that the, there's not going to be change orders and that the quantities are guaranteed so on and so forth is not being truthful. Uh, uh, you know, gentlemen, you can you can chime in here. Quantities no, are estimates. One hundred percent. I could yeah, never. I, think we... I could never tell a board there will not be change orders on a construction project. And I think you highlighted the the I guess the takeaway I want everybody to understand from the last couple slides is, Carolina, that you need to. There's two ways you can do it. You, the engineer that prepared the bid and scope documents can also be hired for project oversight, or you can hire an owner's rep, which a lot of times is an engineer. Um, but make sure that the, the reason I brought all those items up is just because you do want a professional there during the contractor interviews 
so that they can make sure, number one, they ask the right questions, and then with your professional team that those items are inserted into the contract. All right, thank you for that. So now we're gonna move on to funding options. Carolina, this is uh, your show. Okay, so I'll try to speak a little quicker. I know that I have a lot of information on these slides. Um, let's go ahead and get right into it, Jess. All right, so the first, the first thing that we all need to keep in mind is budgeting, okay? One of the first financial pathways to these projects is reserves. Everybody needs to keep something in mind that is often overlooked. A board of directors has an obligation to adopt an annual budget that includes statutory reserves. What does that mean? It's basically a kitty. It's, it's like a 401k for a rainy day or for later um, for capital expenditures and deferred maintenance. The statute enumerates what those are, which are roof replacement, building painting, pavement resurfacing, and then the catch-all, which is any other item with a deferred maintenance expense or replacement cost that exceeds $10,000. I will, I, I, I'm not a betting person, but if I were a betting person, I would say since our legislature is largely reactive and not proactive, we are going to see changes to this statute in the next legislative session. Now, the, how do we calculate reserves? I'm gonna take an example. Let's say your roof costs $100,000 to replace, okay? Or repair, re replace. Um, and the life of your roof is 10 years. Okay, so you divide $100,000 by 10, and that means that every year you should be putting aside in your reserve kitty $10,000 to make sure that by the time that you get to year 10, you would have the money or, or sufficient money to try to repair. Now, it's not a guarantee. They're estimates. The cost of repairs are, are changing every day. There's shortages. There's labor shortages. Actually, one of the issues that um, should come up in contracting, particularly right now, all these contractors are putting in little caveats in their, in their contract saying that um, they can come in and change or increase the prices at any time due to uh, material shortages. So you have to be very careful about that. Um, there are two methods that you would, uh, you, uh, you would basically account for your reserves. There's a pooled or a straight line method. The, the, the standard is straight line, meaning you have a roof, you reserve 100,000. You have painting, you reserve 100,000. And you can only use those funds for that line item. The other method is a pooled reserve method, meaning your roof, your paving, your painting will add up to $300,000. You're reserving $300,000 and you may use those $300,000 for any of those enumerated items. How, well, how do you know what reserves your building should have? Well, first and foremost, it's recommended that an association undertake a reserve study every three to five years. What does that do? A professional would go in and assess your building, okay? Take a look at the components of the building, evaluate what their current condition and what their remaining useful life is, as well as what the repair or replacement value would be. Again, these are estimates. It's not an exact science, uh, but based on that, you will have a total amount, um, similar, similar to when you meet with a financial planner and they tell you, okay, this is how much you have to scroll away so that you can retire. Same concept here. Um, now, here's where we run into a problem, and this is where I really would advocate change. Reserves are not required if the members by majority vote provide for no reserves or less reserves. Historically speaking, reserves are not favored by associations. Why? Because nobody wants to spend extra money and people want to keep their maintenance fees flat. Well, cost of living goes up, people. So if your building hasn't raised maintenance in four, five, six, there's some people that are very proud of not having a maintenance raise in 10 years, that's a warning sign. That's something wrong with your association because it is impossible to tell me that you're keeping your maintenance flat, but we know that garbage has gone up, cable has gone up, 
services have have gone up. So it is important that you keep your budgeting in line with what is the reality and the needs of your community. Um, now, what happens if you do res waive reserves? Well, if you waive reserves in whole or in part, you're going to get to the point where you have to replace that component and you may not have enough money. If you don't have enough money, then you're going to have to specially assess the membership, which nobody likes to specially assess either. So you're losing either way. You lose it. You know, you can't win if you reserve and you can't win if you specially assess. Um, next slide. Okay, so here we go. We have we don't have enough money in our reserves. Um, what what do we do? We have to specially assess. So a special assessment is an assessment that's levied against an owner, other than the assessments that are adopted annually in the budget. They are for generally non-recurring issues for these types of expenditures. They're also there for when you have budget shortfalls. Now, um, the statutory process to adopt a special assessment involves a written notice that has to be mailed, delivered, or electronically transmitted to the unit owners and posted on the property at least 14 days prior to the meeting. And that notice has to specifically state the purpose, um, the amount of the assessment, and the purpose for which the assessment is going to be adopted. Um, and the funds that you collect on that special assessment can only be used for that purpose. The association also has the ability to borrow from a lending institution to fund these projects. And most of these lending institutions, I would say probably all of the lending institutions will require that the association also adopt a special assessment in connection with the financing. One area that is becoming very popular, and we used to always do it um, and encourage it ahead of hurricane season, is an emergency line of credit. So what, what we really pushed it for would be so that the association would have some funds on hand in the event that there's a hurricane and you have to conduct emergency repairs or you have to pay the deductible so that you could get the initial repairs. Um, more and more, I encourage people to consider not only ha having that emergency line of credit available, because you never know what's going to go wrong and what emergency you may need. Um, now, that, this all sounds good, but there are some technicalities involved. Every single association's document is different. Some, some documents require membership approval for a levy of a special assessment. Some require membership approval for obtaining financing. Some will require uh, no approval and just board approval for financing, but not for special assessment and vice versa. And some documents will have different thresholds. So if, you, if it's um, expenditures below five, $500 or $50,000, it's, it's one level. If it's above, every single, um, every single community is different. So you really have to take a look at what your particular association's governing documents say and what you can do. In addition to that, and this is, this is uh, an area of common misconception, if we are talking about a necessary structural repair, and I think we can probably go on to the next slide. Uh, well, Carolyn, um, really quick before we go on to the next sec yeah. uh, section, I'm gonna throw in two questions that I have here in the chat. Uh, the first one, what happens if a special assessment is passed and the money is used by the board for something else? Well, the board's not supposed to use the money for something else, unfortunately. A special assessment may only be used for the purpose for which it was intended. If it, To do it the right way, if you pass a special assessment and you need to utilize the funds for an alternate purpose, that needs to go back to a properly noticed meeting, depending on your governing documents, and you may or may not require a vote of the owners for that. A lot of the times it's, an, it's a meeting, 14-day notice. We have to utilize these funds for an alternate purpose. Um, unfortunately, with a lot of associations, if you don't have proactive, proactive budgeting, you get into a situation where you're trying to rob Peter to pay Paul. I get situations where I'm hearing people saying, we're going to borrow against reserves. There is no such thing as borrowing against reserves. Does not exist. If you're doing it, 
it, it, it, there is no such thing. You're utilizing reserves. If you're using reserves for a reserve item, you're using reserves. If you're using reserves for other purposes, you're not supposed to. You need to have a membership vote to utilize reserves for alternate purposes. Thanks. And uh, just quickly to add to that, then the only recourse, right, if that comes to light and no action is taken, do they follow the complaint with the department? So there are, there, there, there would be a Not going a down the rabbit more, hole, but. Yeah, I don't want to go yeah. down that rabbit hole and, yeah. and, and inundate the, the division, but yes, there are some recourses with, with the division. Um, Got it. You know, keep in mind there's consequences with that because if, you know, there, there could be fines imposed and ultimately all the members suffer the consequences as well. But um, yeah, there are some alternatives for, uh, for addressing this. And keep in mind, as members, you have access to the official records of the association. So you have a right to see where the money is going. All right, thanks. We can move on to the next uh, section. Jess? All right, so this is where we get into the nuance and the uh, often political agendas of different boards and different constituencies. The difference between what is maintenance, repair, and replacement and what is necessary versus alterations and material alterations, because there is a distinction. Next slide. Slide. Hello? Did I lose you guys? Nope, we hear you. There we go. There we go. All right. So let's start with the basic principle that the association, by and through its board of directors, is responsible for the maintenance, repair, and replacement of common elements. And the board of directors has the ability to impose assessments to fund the cost of these maintenance, repair, or replacement projects. Um, that broad statement is the statute, it, it's, a, it's built into the statute, so the board does have broad authority to impose special assessments for maintenance purposes. And generally speaking, a vote of the unit owners would not be required um, for work that is not a material or substantial alteration or addition to the common elements. Um, when we talk about maintenance, repair, and replacement, we really should be in the mindset of a like kind or necessary to comply with the code. Um, because your carpeting needs to be repaired or replaced, doesn't mean you're going from pink to purple or pink to, to blue. Um, you probably have to go from pink to pink. Um, now, approval of the owners may be required if the project is deemed a material alteration or a substantial addition. And the term material alteration or substantial addition it has been defined to, to mean, and this is really taken from the cases, to palpably or perceptively vary, change form, shape, elements, or specifications of a building from its original design plan existing condition in such a manner as to appreciably affect or influence its function, use, or appearance. That is a mouthful. Um, but to give you a quick example, like I said, changing from pink to blue, or I have a lot of associations, they had um, a, a shuffle, shuffle, court, uh, uh, shuffle ball courts um, because that used to be in style in many years ago. I don't know if it's come back. Now pickleball seems to be very popular. So we have a lot of associations who want to change the shuffleboard courts to pickleball courts. That is a material alteration because you're changing the use. I have associations that want to install playgrounds where there wasn't a playground, or I have associations that have saunas that have not been in use for many years. They want to turn that into a bike storage or what have you. Those are material alterations. Next slide. So the statute indicates that if your declaration does not provide otherwise, a material alteration requires an approval of 75% of the total voting interest. Now also keep in mind that there's a difference between an alteration and a material alteration. Not every alteration is material, not every, um, in, in your governing documents will, will address, um, will sometimes have some threshold 
uh, monetary um, uh, monetary threshold for alterations that may or may not require approval. You have to look at that nuance very carefully. Um, this is really something that is document specific. So you have to look at your declaration, your bylaws, and your articles because your declaration may say something and then you will look in your bylaws and the threshold or the requirements may change. So it's very important that you work with your council when you're considering making a change uh, or, or getting into one of these projects to make sure that you have the ability to do it. Uh, Carolina, as we go into this next section, uh, I want you to keep mm -hmm. this question in mind. I think you're going to answer it, um, but I have a little, a, a lengthy question here. So uh, from Mr. Burt, I am a board member in Lee County. I keep hearing we, you, and such, but who is ultimately responsible? Board president, building manager, management company, the board as a whole, the county, the building owners. It's easy to say you should do such and such, but who must do these things to assure repairs get done? We all seem to know what to do and how to do it, but who ultimately is accountable? Boy, that's so, a loaded question. Yeah, so let's, <laughs> well, that's let's, a loaded I think question. we'll work through so, it. We're going to work through the question, but ultimately, I think everybody shares some responsibility, but the buck ultimately does stop with the board of directors um, and the association. Obviously, there's insurances in place and things of that nature, but the, uh, the board member, the, the buck does ultimately stop with the board members. And I say that with the caveat that the members have some responsibility too. If you are a member and you do not participate in the governance of your community, if you do not vote, if you do not advocate for proper budgeting, proper to reserves, you are just res as responsible as anybody else. This should be a team effort and we should all understand that the board is, uh, they're volunteers, okay? You should give, and when you, you the, the other members should give your board members the support that is necessary to ensure that you have proper funding and proper managing of these projects. Um, all right, so let's go into the next slide and we'll tackle, I'm hoping I'll shed some more light on that, on that very, very loaded question. All right, um, one of the big things, everybody gets upset with these projects, but the fact that it costs a lot of money doesn't make it uh, a material substantial alteration. If construction is necessary to protect the common elements, the association can override and properly assess unit owners for the cost of repairs. So, for example, if your governing documents say you can't levy a special assessment over $100,000 and your roof is about to collapse or your roof has exceeded its life expectancy and you have to do it because it's necessary you're probably going to be able to override that. You need to speak to your legal counsel because the, the alternate argument is what you're just going to let your roof collapse because your membership won't approve the expenditure. No, that would be that, that would be foolish. We need to protect the integrity of the property. All right, next slide because I covered everything else. All right, so now we get into the juicy section. Yes. By the way, uh, Reeves asks, is going from wallpaper to paint considered a material alteration most likely? Um, it, it very well could be, depending on the circumstances. Absolutely. All right, so board members, you have a statutory fiduciary relationship to your unit owners, and you have an obligation as board members to discharge your duties in good faith and in the best interest of the association. Now, historically speaking, and this may change, absent fraud, self-dealing, and betrayal of trust, the board members are not personally liable for the decisions that they make in their capacity as directors of associations. Why do we do that? Again, we recognize that board members are laypersons. They are doing their very best with what they have, but what is the best way to protect yourself as a board member? and I think I've said it three times now, avail yourself of your consultants, avail yourself of your manager, avail yourself of your engineers, of your project managers, of your lawyers. Listen to these professionals. They know what they're talking about, or I would hope they know what they, they're talking about. Um, 
you know, it, it's, it's incredibly important to protect yourself personally by, by availing yourself of your consultants because they're in Florida, there's something called the business judgment rule, which would essentially shield you from liability. I see a typo, I apologize. Um, which would shield you from liability if you are acting in a reasonable manner. If you're following advice of counsel, if you're following the advice of your engineer and your manager, then you're acting in a reasonable manner. If your counsel, if your engineer, if your manager is telling you to do something and you absolutely ignore it or refuse to act in a timely fashion, you may be deemed not to be acting in a reasonable manner and in that situation, you may be held liable. So always, always be prepared, build your team, make sure that your association has proper DNO coverage to protect you against any claims of failing to meet your responsibilities. Again, confirm with your insurance agent, avail yourself of your professionals. Next. That, but I do have a few questions here that I know we're a little over, but we have a few, I think we have a few minutes to address, Carolina. Okay, so. And also let's say wanna, uh, we have here from Terry Owens, what is a majority vote to waive reserves, majority of total voting interest or majority at the meeting where a quorum is obtained? So that really depends on your governing documents. Some governing documents will indicate that it's a majority of the total membership. Some will indicate uh, that it's majority at a properly noticed meeting, and then you have to look at what constitutes a meeting, and it will tell you whether or not a, it's a meeting at which quorum is obtained. So it is very document specific, and you should speak to your counsel um, on, on what your specific documents indicate. Thanks. Um, we have from Madeline, can the board announce an assessment before passage, before the conclusion of the 14-day notice? Asking this as to when an owner who is selling his unit is, I guess, obligated to inform the borrower. Okay. Um, a lot of associations will, will take a proactive approach and let individuals know, you know, let their membership know that they're contemplating on a special assessment. Honestly, I think that's a good idea. I think you, sh you, you, you want to have ongoing communication with your members. It's no secret. Unfortunately, for political reasons, boards that pass special assessments don't tend to be very popular. So they're scared to talk about the, you know, it's like, it's like a four letter word to talk about assessments. It shouldn't be. This is what you guys need to do to get your building fixed. And if you didn't have the budget for it, you have to you have to specially assess. So um, as far as the obligation, um, if if you are selling and you're aware, you have to consult with your realtor. Uh, I'm not a, a a licensed realtor to know what those obligations would be from a seller disclosure point of view, but I know that there is an estoppel that has to be provided. Um, in connection with the sale, and it does talk about upcoming special assessments. Um, I think that pretty much covers that question. Jess, are we sending out a copy of this to everyone that has registered of the PowerPoint presentation? Not that I know of, unless it's, it's asked for. All right, great. So if you are interested, we can send this over. However, um, you, can, um, you can email info at castlegroup.com and we will send you a link to the recorded webinar. Uh, that way, if you missed any information, you can uh, go back and review the webinar as a whole. Perfect. Thank you. Um, is changing the style or design of a window from a single hung to a casement within the same existing opening? Is this uh, allowable? Should the association seek a declarative judgment to avoid a lawsuit? So the style may be a material alteration because you can remember if, if it looks different. But what we get a lot is uh, specifically with windows um, changing from like the, um, you know, regular window to impact glass. And if that impact glass, um, and, and I'm going to rely on Michael and Paul to correct me from technicalities, but if 
that changes the look a little bit. That may not necessarily be considered a material alteration. However, your board does have the ability to adopt rules and regulations regarding um, the installation of impact glass windows, meaning the look, the color, um, the style, the tinting that would go there. Um, those should be in place. Your board should adopt those um, as far as those specifications so that you can have any unit owner who wishes to undertake replacement of their windows and installation of impact glass, which is always a great safety thing, so that everybody goes and gets a similarly looking um, uh, window and there's, there's standards and rules that are followed and that they're uniformly enforced. Um, here's another question. I, I think it's in line with a, a, another question you answered earlier, just a different scenario. What, is the, what if the association wants to modernize uh, their elevators? Will the approval, will they require approval of the owners? So yes and no. The, the word modernization of an elevator, and Michael and Paul, feel free to chime in, is a loaded mm -hmm. word. There are, different, there are different aspects of elevator modernization. Frankly speaking, my recommendation is to focus on the components of the elevator, the, the, the stuff that you can't see versus the pretty stuff. If you're really changing the pretty stuff, that may be deemed a, a material alteration if you are not replacing it with similar color patterns or, or a similar look. But the focus here with elevators, and I could go into a whole separate lecture on this, is it's what you don't see that's more important than what you do see. Just because the elevator is ugly, okay, ugly doesn't mean functioning. And the back end of the house, the little elevator room, the components, the buttons, the everything that I don't know about technical and I defer to my construction guys on it. Mm -hmm. That's what counts when it comes to it. So don't focus so much on whether it looks pretty or not or modern or not. Make sure that that elevator, that the components that you can't see are working and are modernized. That's really the important factor here. Correct. Yes, the cab does not have to be updated to modernize your elevator. The, the reason you modernize is because you can no longer find parts. They're not fabricated anymore for your older elevator. That's the reason why you have to go through a modernization. But that doesn't mean that you have to update the cab, right? That's that would be a separate item. Yeah, well put, Michael. I think this the conversation certainly won't don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but you know the modernization of elevators, not being able to find the parts, the replacement of windows with a different like we have an issue with windows right now. Nothing we order matches the current, so there will be a slight deviation. The the old windows that are right next to the ones we're replacing, they don't meet code, but these do. So these these are really loaded questions in terms of you know, what we can and can't do. And I guess stress Carolina's point is you gotta rely on your team of experts. And even like when we have repair drawings and we're working on a certain elevation, we have to bring that elevation up to code. And does that affect other elevations? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's nothing to tie into to meet code at the next elevation. So these are really, really kind of loaded, complicated questions. So again, rely on your team um, is probably the best advice. Right, well, we have no more questions on the chat. Thank you for uh, everyone who participated on both sides, our panelists uh, and all our attendees. Um, again, uh, for more information, please contact us at info at castlegroup.com. Uh, and again, I want to give everyone an opportunity to uh, the panelists to kind of uh, say thank you. It's been great working with you guys on this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. This is nice. Our pleasure. Thank you. All right, with that being said, again, thank you. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing everyone on our next webinar. Excellent. Bye-bye, everybody. All right. Take care. Be Bye, safe. Bye, thank you.